So now I'm happy to welcome Sumantri Samarik Rama with us. And thank you for joining us at such late hour. I know it's a bit, <laughs> it's quite late with you, so thank you very much. Uh, Sumantri is lecturer, media and communication design coordinator and director of research at the Department of Integrated Design, Faculty of Architecture, University of Maratuva in Sri Lanka. Focusing uh, her research work in uh, learning the practices of um, type design and its evolution in Sri Lanka, finding um, and kind of um, researching letter forms, um, Sinhala letter forms in particular. She holds a bachelor honorable degree in design in the area graphic design from the University of Maratuba and a Master of Arts degree in Visual Communication from the La Salle College of Arts in Singapore. She also has a PhD in Typography and Education, where she continues her research and supervision of multiple postgraduate research on type-based and communication design. It's a long, long words. Um, and, but also Sumantri is practicing um, corporate identities, information design, and is editor-in-chief of the, of the Faru Journal, which, as I understand, um, focuses on kind of discussing fundamental and applied research on space and its different um, dimensions of it uh, within discipline of the built environment, town and country planning, building economics and design. So it's, a, it's an interesting, interesting field. She's also involved in the Akuro Collective, uh, which is exploring the world of Sinhala typography and uh, Sinhala and Tamil typography. And I think you're also a TAS sports enthusiast. So thank you very much. Welcome. And um, you will give us some insights in the Sinhala history and orthography. Well, thank you for inviting. It's a pleasure to be here. Great. Okay, let's uh, play your talk and we'll see you afterwards for a question or two. Thanks. Hi, I'm Sumantri. I'm coming from a culture where books look like this. Pages look like this. The cover, the binding and the jacket. Each of these covers, front and the back, is made out of wood with highly decorative elements painted on it. These come in different sizes, from small to large. They even have special boxes, all handcrafted and painted to store these books, and even large storage units to keep them safe. And this was our book culture up until the 18th century. When the West was using quail, ink on paper, we used a stylus, a metal rod, that carved engraved letters on treated palm tree leaves. These engraved letters started to appear only after the application of a mixture made out of charcoal and oil mints. The compilation of these books, the wrapping, the stacking, all had an art to it. These books were sacred. It was not sacred because of the Buddhist scripture written on it. It was also because it was considered as knowledge. Knowledge on indigenous medicine, astronomy, history, and all aspects of our culture. When paper was introduced to Sri Lanka by the Portuguese around the 1500s, we declined the approval of it, looking at its flimsy nature compared to the firm natural nature of the palm leaf. But we adapted to paper very slowly in around the 1700s. The proposal for a new press was tabled in 1720 by the Dutch administration, who were in control of the political power of the country. It took us nearly 15 to 17 years to find an individual who could design uh, or cast a singular letter to witness the first singular print. So by around the mid 1700s, the manuscript writing culture was slowly deteriorating 
and transitioning towards a print publishing culture. By 1700s, to be precise, the late 1700s, Sri Lanka witnessed another political change, the British. After their arrival, Sri Lanka saw the establishment of the newspaper industry. The printing of newspapers to the English-speaking community of the island. Obviously, the manuscript writing culture was right now completely deteriorated and new print technologies had taken over. The Sri Lankan native speakers of Sinhala and Tamil needed to adapt to these new technologies. As a result, the Sinhala speaking community saw their first Sinhala newspaper published nearly 50 years later. So the time taken to print the first English newspaper and the first Sinhala newspaper within the island took nearly half a century. What does this mean? Do we see certain cultures being lost and others dominating? Or do we see a cultural lag due to new inventions and ideas? Or do we see cultural diffusion, which talks about the spreading of cultural traits from one culture to another? Since the field of typography can be discussed in the social sciences and the theme of this series addresses society, I want to answer this from a social scientist point of view. And of course, the growth of typography or changes in typographic history is highly influenced by society, culture, and community. So coming back into the question, what does this mean? Or why is there a cultural lack every time we transition from one technology to another, from one idea to another, or one need to another? From a Marxist point of view, we can call it the force of production that pushes one mode to another. The local book production pushes towards the letterpress book production. It also can be observed that the local book production was limited to a small community and the letterpress catering to a wider community that pushed the boundaries of inequality and power that resulted in a revolution, which further resulted in this cultural lack of transitioning from written culture to a production culture. From the perspective of Max Weber, he calls or he talks about the reasons for this change is the way we think, in other words, ideas. He talks about the moves from traditionalism to modernism was because people started rationalizing. If we look at the Dutch administration ruling Sri Lanka during the 1700s, the rationalization is seen with their need of a methodical system that involved a procedure to follow. The methodical system was the press, and the results they required was more Bibles and printed material to continue their mission of evangelization. So thinking rationally means thinking reflectively. As a result, the constant need and urge to look for new ways to improve ends up with new and better and more efficient ways to make Bibles or books. The traditional society was about individual artisans and the modern society was about explicit instructions, standardized methodical, standardized methodical procedures that are always reflected on an improvement. So as a result, at the turn of the 18th century, the press that was printing Bibles and notices ended up contributing towards the establishment of the newspaper industry, with new machines such as monotypes, linotypes contributing to this change. Today, everything is digitalized, new techniques, new fonts, new layouts, and of course, new thinking. But if I look back and ask, are we centuries apart from the mainstream typographic culture? Maybe not too far, but yes, there is a cultural lag. If I uh, answer from a subculture point of view, let me tell you where I'm coming from. So design as a field of study was established only in the early 2000s, that is around 20 years ago. And typography as a main subject uh, was obviously discussed within this large umbrella. So during this uh, institutionalization process, subjects were introduced with huge philosophical or historic setting. It highlighted fundamental knowledge that derived out of this historic setting. 
In other words, typography was always backed up with the invention of the printing or the transition of new machinery, but it was biased to Western perspective. From a holistic point of view, when teaching a subject about letters, we rarely spoke about native letters. As an educator, this was one of the biggest challenges I came across. Because here, I'm trying to establish a field of study with no fundamental knowledge that is needed to build a conversation. Because I did not know the language to communicate to this mainstream culture. Here, what I mean as language is the language that allows us to share things that mix up our culture. In this case, our typographic culture. The culture that you and I are right now conversing. So as a type educator, my contribution to the field was first to identify the subculture within the mainstream culture. I needed to, I needed to start from the scratch, the anatomy. You think anatomy is naming parts? Well, yeah, but if you don't have letters, or may I say, don't know what type of letters to pick when you have a bowl full of inscriptions, manuscripts, letters, painted and printed, which one would you pick? As a start, I paid a visit to the archives to observe the first prints of Sri Lankan books, newspapers, and many more. I catalogued them and identified typefaces of nearly 200 years. And of course, I limited to body text and learned that there were only around 36 to 40 similar typefaces that were very well used. Um, I must say for the first 100 years, there were only four typefaces with different sizes. The rest was found in the other century. Uh, thereafter, I was curious to know the metadata of these typefaces. I wanted to look at typefaces and say, oh, this is Baskerville, this is Caslon. But my history did not help me. The Garamons and the Gaudis were never known, as most type designers were quiet contributors to this field of typography. Our history never recorded them, but only their work. So to be fair by them, I catalogued their work, named them, estimated the time of the design, tracked the press or the foundry, noted down the sizes, the size variations, and uh, named the designers wherever it was recorded. And this was a good start. Well, a good start to define the singular anatomy. The learnings were such that Singular had more reference lines because we had more visual variations within a letter. And of course, we do not have a X height. And this, we don't have a letter X. But the letter per that defined all the parameters of the letter X filled this gap. So now that we had defined the reference lines and the letters were sitting on them, it was about naming the visual variations. I did this in a very scientific manner. I started by observing each letter from top to bottom, broke the letters, fixed them, and then I tried to understand each part of the letter that needed to be named. As a result, a new set of nomenclature was introduced to define the anatomy of the singular letters. The naming too was done in a scientific manner where I observed terminology shared with my neighboring countries because most of us had a lot of visual variations within a letter. So in conclusion, the fundamentals I needed to build a conversation was in place. Today, defining the anatomy has made new ways of research. Among many is the contribution towards a singular type design process. Let me quote Girish Dalvi. He uses the term root letters and states that it derived from the Indian philosophic concept of bija akshara. Bija meaning seed and akshara meaning letters. And hypothesis a set of primordial letters which contains the germ of an entire font. For example, words such as Hamburg font save or Hamburg's uh, and addition are words that are made out of root letters for Latin. With the concept of identifying the minimal letters with maximum properties via scoring sheet, 
I was able to identify a set of root letters for Sinhala. So within this scientific search, I was also able to identify a set of unique letters among Sinhala alphabet. So during the type design process, one could either ignore these letters or take time in designing them. Another perspective was building of a grid and discovering a set of root letters by manipulating the grid. Another set of tendric uh, letters were identified to accelerate the singular type design process. This grid system also helped to analyze existing letters since we do not have any records of a type designer documenting his or her work we needed to identify a mechanism to work backwards. So I must say the work, uh, this worked well with display typefaces. For example, if we are left with a type specimen and want to generate a set of clips to complete a font, it requires the observation of the skeleton of the letter. And the visual variations proposed that I put together uh, help to observe the flesh of the letter its embellishments, and more interestingly, the base grid that is required to design another new set of fonts. So this knowledge on how to analyze letters was adapted by a few of my research students to document the evolution of graphic design in Sri Lanka. Uh, the work was focused on book titles, movie posters, and any other areas that was related to graphic design. I must say that the learnings are expanding into new areas of design and we can see how we can contribute to similar disciplines. Uh, we also believe that this type of collective contribution will help to classify singular typefaces and contribute towards designing new styles, new type styles and new graphics and so on. Uh, these are a few photos from a workshop I conducted in India where I, uh, what I did here was to test my learnings and to see if we can be adapted to similar scripts uh, such as Telangu Malayalam, Ria and so on and the results were breathtaking. Defining the anatomy also led to research on legibility. So we use this knowledge and analyze the existing typeface used for directional signboards in Sri Lanka and learn that uh, it was not fulfilling the required purpose. The study revealed a set of personality traits that were required when adapting or designing a typeface for directional signboards and that uh, each typeface had its certain visual properties that should cater to its role. I believe this type of conversation has helped us to converse well, but this conversation should not be only within us. It should not be limited to our culture, our typographic culture. Therefore, to further this field of typography, we need to come together, align ourselves together with typographic ideas and values and take a more multiculturalism perspective and understand that each of these cultures have individual flavor. In other words, the manuscript culture that I spoke to you about was mine. It should be ours because each individual culture has its own flavor and by identifying them and acknowledging them, we will advocate equal standings of this typographic society. And with this, I conclude my presentation. Thank you so much, Sumantri, for this wonderful and insightful talk. Let's see if we have any questions. Okay, no? So I have a couple. Um, Thank for you so much, Sumantri. First, for um, really amazing work. I mean, alone the research, you must have been going through all the <laughs> and catalogizing and everything. I'm sure it took plenty of time and uh, was, I guess, not always uh, happy, happy moments. <laughs> sure. Um, it's, but it's a long process, yeah. Do you have, will you 
have a publication for us. Will you or are you preparing some kind of guidelines, something, you know, for uh, us type designers to understand better? Well, that's a plan. Uh, well, it is uh, been cooking for a while. Uh, I, I think the research is the research, other research work is uh, pulling it down. So as a result, um, uh, it's getting delayed, but for sure, hopefully we will see the light of it soon. I'm waiting for it to come out. And so most of the content is ready. Um, so it's a, it's a matter of just laying it out now. So as soon as that is done, we will be sharing. Okay, that, that's great, fantastic, super. And I also wonder, you know, seeing these beautiful manuscripts and the way um, how books uh, were, were done, um, is there some kind of contemporary interpretation? So are they, uh, I mean, is there a kind of a calligraphic uh, efforts or uh, contemporary manuscripts that revive, that use these techniques? Uh, well, we don't have. So it, it, what has actually happened is uh, it, it is still part of history. So nobody writes on these manuscripts except uh, uh, to a very small community who would most probably uh, be predicting your future. That would be astrologers. They would be using this technique. Other than that, uh, we rarely see it. But uh, discussions and uh, like when it comes to historical aspect, people, uh, well, academically, uh, there is another university who teaches on how it is done, but uh, of course it is not used in um, a mainstream, uh, as a main subject area or so. But uh, come, talking about the sub, uh, manuscripts itself, uh, there too, we have also identified that uh, there itself is a, is that is actually the Sri Lankan calligraphic culture where right now nobody's talking about or have put uh, their time in doing research. Obviously, if we get into that, there will be another large area of understanding how um, script form, how, uh, how different formations of the letter has evolved. So one is, um, uh, of course, there is an area of research that can be done. And uh, uh, no... Uh, uh, I, I believe the fact that we are able to, we have defined the anatomy, we, are, we can go back now and uh, analyze it uh, as a starting point. So that's what's going on with the inscriptions. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. So if um, there are any more questions, please post them on the hub in Vito and Sumantri will hopefully um, be able to, to reply. I'm sure she will, and we'll see you later in the panel. And now for another little session of Lorena, some, um, some groovy music to... Mm -hmm.